Um, public service announcement lately. I've been making this that uh, uh, that you do not have a soul, especially if you're new. It's important to know that or to remember that you do not have a soul. You are a soul. That uh, that's that's a that's a 180 degree. That's a kind of spiritual hokey pokey that. It, it does good to remind people because we're working on the, a kind of uh, continuing vocabulary of soul. My thinking is that uh, if you uh, if you don't have words for it, you can't even hardly think about it, let alone practice it. And I'm really uh, trying to uh, uh, work on that in the last few, well, last month and a half or so, and I'm going to continue because there's much more to learn about the soul. Uh, today, I want to talk about um, uh, fear, courage, and the life of the soul. That's sort of the uh, the topic we'll explore, fear, uh, courage, and the life of the soul. Um, now, this is coming from several different sources that I've read, but, you know, just trying to distill it down. First of all, what's the fear about? Well, whatever you're disconnected from uh, the ground of being itself. That's a term I like, you know, um, when you talk about ultimate reality, God just uh, has, I, I mean, I, I can, I like it, but uh, I know where it came from, but it's got a lot of baggage for some people. Uh, the ground of being itself, whenever you're disconnected from the ground of being itself, you will be insecure. Uh, those of you who know the Enneagram, your Enneagram type, your Ennea type is a reaction to this loss of connection with being itself, the ground of being itself. It's like you have no ground under your feet. And, uh, and so the, the personality type that we have is, is a reaction to it and a defensive reaction to, to it. And we talked last week about roles, how the, the ego builds some protection, and then you, you have a role, you know, and several roles during your lifetime. Those are all well and good, but um, they're not you. You are a soul that has an ego uh, that generates these roles. It's fine. You know, I'm a father. I'm still a father. That's a role. But you, if you don't identify it with it, that's the key. And you identify with the fact that you are this eternal uh uh, energy, this eternal being that also is human for a while, and it's lovely to be human. But your and your type is a reaction to this kind of loss. And as long as you identify with your personality, with your role, you'll live in fear. That's the basic understanding of the uh, the Sufis who did the Enneagram. Really, I'm not. I have no doubts about that. And then, so if you're, that's where fear comes from. And plus, we also know, as you get older, you also know that this this form, you know, if you're identified with your body totally, well, that'll be very fearful as you age, as the body changes in ways we don't expect and don't like necessarily. Uh, and whenever you look outside of yourself for security, the search becomes endless. So that's the that's the deal with the fear. It's just built in. It's baked into the thing. When we have been, you know, the babies, we got to identify with the body. We don't even have any role yet. And then, uh, not that the body is bad in any way, but if you think it's you, you're going to be more fearful as you age. And as you know, even though we push it in the back part of our mind, that sometime this body is going to stop functioning, you know, uh, that's, you, you can't avoid that forever, especially as you get older, you know as you age. And so that's sort of the, where the, the, our, our personalities are a reaction to that loss of connection to, to being itself. I remember uh, there's a story in Seven Story Mountain where uh, Merton, who had just was all over the place in the early part of his life, uh, just we were really just could never find ground, a spiritual ground. And then one thing led to another. He, he was writing, he had just got a book at a bookstore uh, by uh, 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 Etienne Gilson, uh, Gilson, and it was on medieval philosophy. And he's reading a book, going, going on that thing out to Long Island to see his grandparents who lived out there. He was, he was a student at Columbia. 
and he read this passage that absolutely blew his mind. It blew his whole, you know, he realized that like Jill Stone said, he said, you know, God is not a being, is not a supreme being. God is being itself, which is a, it's a 180. God is a, the structure of being itself. And he realized that in the 12th and 13th century in the monasteries, they, they had this view. Well, we've totally lost that. You know, we, we created an image of God uh, based on the culture. But that idea that God was being itself, Tillich, Paul Tillich called it the ground of all being, being itself. You know, that blew his mind. He realized there was, he ends up in, not too long, end up entering this medieval order. Really, the Trappists were living a medieval life, but he, he said, they got something there he never had any ground and he said huh oh, yeah so that's 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 actually uh was his conversion point and he sort of stuck with that his whole life he was trying to connect with that deepest deepest reality the ultimate reality you yeah. know how do we become disconnected from it and fearful well birth trauma for sure you know we're all connected inside our mother and then all of a sudden that all goes away, you know, that falls apart. I mean, it really has to fall apart. If we stayed in there much longer than eight and a half or nine months, it goes south for everybody. But it falls apart, we get expelled, they cut the cord, think of the trauma there. And then we're in a huge space with all these big beings, I mean, light, you know, uh, trauma, trauma. And, you know, we've, we've it's visceral, this disconnection from the mother. And um, plus, as the Tibetans talk about, because they're the, the Buddhists who talk about uh, coming, going around and around and around and reincarnations. Dalai Lama is the 14th reincarnation of the same energy. Uh, they say we just forget most of it um, in terms of details. And even this connection, the, <laughs> the, the, the most important thing of all, we forget. Wordsworth said, we come into this life trailing clouds of glory that are all too soon forgotten. Yeah, so we're sort of homo amnesians. We forgot the most important thing, that we're always connected to absolute being. Nothing can sever that connection other than the thought that we're not connected, other than the trauma that makes us think we're not connected, you see? So that's sort of the rub, okay? Now, um, the oldest formal religion in the world, uh, Hinduism, 4,000 years old, uh, what they called yoga was not necessarily, it, you know, included the postures that you know about yoga, but yoga meant, it was, it was like a word that meant to yoke yourself. In other words, like the oxen are yoked to them. So you, together, you yoke yourself with the, with the, with the Supreme God, uh, the, the ground of being. You, it, there are ways of yoking yourself. There are practices, you see. So that's what they call yoga, not just the thing that came in the 50s to the United States and people thought it was weird at first. Now it's sort of, you know, things work their way into a culture. Even meditation is not that weird, but it's still sort of weird. But yoga, you know, people go to yoga, but yoga really meant to relink yourself, you see. Religio in Latin, you know, yoga is Sanskrit, but religio in Latin meant to relink yourself. That was the purpose of religion, east or west, is to uh, relink you to the ground of being, okay? And that's what it's supposed to do. And uh, to, to the extent that it does that for you, that's great. But uh, so how do we really lose, how did even our religion, at least in the West, which we're all we are, uh, how did that actually lose that ability? Well, you know, things happen. You know, the Christ, you know, Jesus left it in other people's hands for 300 years. It was a very interesting way of relinking yourself back to this primal force that people died rather than give up. Well, when it got in the uh, in the fourth century, when the empire sort of absorbed Christianity, and uh, then you know, a thousand for a thousand years, it was in the empire, and it changed. It changed the whole flavor of it. Albeit the fact that there were mystics and great saints for the whole time, uh, 
it, it was losing its ability towards the end of the 13, 1400s to really link the people. But there was still some linkage, you know, Notre Dame, I saw they're, they're, they're uh, trying to get it all renovated uh, by the 2024 Olympics. Uh, they've been working on it for four years. Well, they sp people spent 200 years working on that, you know. So there was some 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 glue that this uh, that this force had, but it had got become all corrupt, and that's why you have. I want to give you like a little uh, sixth century view of how religion became less and less able to link us to the ground of being. You know, you got uh, you got Luther in the uh, in the in the Reformation in the 16th century, in the 1500s, just reacting against, you know, they were selling indulgences and, you know, there was three, you know, at some one point there were three popes, two of them lived in France. It was just, it had just sort of gone all empire, all imperial. And so Luther was reacting to that. Uh, so that was the first thing. And in a way, um, Catholic religion been in kind of defensive posture since the 15th, 16th century. Well, the 17th century, you have the emergence of uh, Western philosophy, not just theology. Now you've got philosophy. And then you got somebody like Descartes right in the middle of the century saying, um, oh, I think therefore I am. That's, a, that's, that's, nobody had that thought or put it quite that way that, so you identify with the mind now. So, so they identify, you know, I think therefore I am. That's, that's in the 17th century. 18th century, uh, you have science coming out of that, which is a great, you know, this is all good stuff, uh, but uh, the we're losing the, the sense of linking ourselves to ultimate reality. It gets lost because with science comes materialism, uh, matter. You, we learn about measurement and stars and stuff, and that's all great stuff, but then we sort of thought, well, just... Uh, you know, you, you got to be able to see it, measure it, weigh it. That all starts to come in. And uh, the the soul aspect of things is fading then. A 19th century, they take, they build it on that. And now industrialization is happening. Technology is helping, happening in the 1800s. Uh, in the, in, in the uh, uh, 19th century, in the 18th century, along as the whole God thing starts to crumble, well, the idea that, uh, divine right of kings and queens and all that starts to crumble because the whole idea of the divine starts to crumble. And that's in a way a good thing in terms of politics because then you have the movement in democracy in the uh, United States, America, and France. Okay, so these are all, these are, this is just how history is working. And just to give you a context of, and that the, the church becomes, and the whole theology and the, even the notion of soul and the divine it starts to get more distant. And, uh, but I mean, when you're in the Middle Ages, uh, and if you, this was a, both a good and a bad thing, but mostly a bad thing, if, if you went against the uh, common belief, I mean, a group like this, you know, we could all get burned at the stake, but back then, because <laughs> heresy just meant you have a different opinion. That's really what, <laughs> a different opinion from the church. You're a heretic, and you could get, you know, you become toast. Uh, but you know, if if you weren't quite that serious, but you just cross lines with the imperial religion, they would take a the Easter candle, turn it upside down, and put out the flame, which meant your soul was eternally damned. Soul meant something then. That was the most feared thing in the world. So they still had a vocabulary of soul, still had an understanding, but it got it was all out of whack. It was all out of whack. So we got, you know, the Reformation, we got philosophy coming, I think therefore I am, we've got physical science coming in, Newton and all the boys there. Uh, actually, the guys who started, uh, uh, the, a lot of the founding fathers were, were really physical scientists who be believed that God was a kind of a guy who started the clock, but then he was on vacation. They were called deists. He started the clock. It was up to us to keep it running. So that was our view of God, the great clockmaker. And he, 
made all this, that the planet was actually a, like a device, like technology, like a clock. And then, you know, industrialization, 19th century, we got factories, drove William Blake crazy. <laughs> and in the 20th century, we were globalization now. Now we, we're connected to the whole world. We're trading with the whole world. It also globalized war. We had a world war, one and two, brought in, uh, you know, Europe and Asia. Uh, so there's always good and bad mix with it. But, but part of the effect was it's, we've lost any concept of anything non-material as important. Uh, and so now we're connected to everybody all the time. Uh, you know, with, with uh, these uh, cell phones. And, uh, you know, that has pluses and minuses too. I just heard a study that said the average uh, uh, high school uh, student gets uh, uh, upwards of uh, uh, 800 or 900 texts a day. How can you live your life like that? No wonder you can't study. It's, uh, there's, there's upsides and downsides to that. But the idea that we're a soul that has all this stuff Yes, that's that's gone. It's really faded. And uh, now we have in the twenty first century where we are, we have artificial intelligence, uh, and we also have artificial truth. You know, what is reality? What's fake? Um, you know, the 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 AI, the guy who really invented AI, and they say. Uh, he says, he's warning against, he says, you know, not too long of a step that somebody calls you with a voice of your mother. And she tells you she needs something or whatever. And, you know, the, you, you, you think the households and the, uh, on the phone are, they're going to be even more dangerous because it'll sound like somebody, you know, because they can use their voice. And now what is the truth? Was the election stolen or not? It's just, and then so the country gets divided, the world gets divided, uh, and it's really a kind of tribal thing now, rather than, all right, the truth, we can, we can agree on this fact. Mm. So this is very, we have all kinds of uh, uh, unforeseen uh, consequences as we evolve, as our technology evolves along with us, you see. Now we're, you know, it's, we're, if you saw the movie 2001, the computer threatened the life of the astronauts. Well, we got to be careful about this. Uh, but we've lost the, the sense that um, we identify with the personality, we identify with the roles, we identify with all the bling, you know? You know, so how do you get on TV in America? Three ways, you're attractive, so attracts, you're, you're attractive, you've achieved something, or you're affluent, or what I call the triple A, you know, the, and say if you've done all three of those, you know, you got your own series, you know, whatever it is. But I mean, just normal people, they don't really get on TV. And uh, the soul is not one of the reasons you're getting on the TV. The fact that you're connected to something deeper, the fact that we're all connected to something deeper, that we're all brothers and sisters, that we're all, you know, the plants, the animals. The Buddhists had this view 500 years BC. That's where they talk about the, the connection of all sentient beings. We sort of, that gets thrown out with any kind of thing that's not material, you see. So in this, in this environment though that we are, what's the meaning of courage? We have fear now and we see how it's worked and how it's sort of things have gotten a little bit uh, overwhelming in a lot of ways. Well, what's courage? What's the meaning of courage? Again, we the movies have sort of co-opted that, you know, some guy with a gun, you know, uh, there's a bad guy and some, some guy, a good guy with a gun comes and kills the bad guy. That's essentially the, the thing of what we believe is courage, you know, Rambo-ish kind of stuff. Uh, what's the meaning, true meaning of courage? You know, somebody, somebody who we shouldn't forget, he said, well, what does it profit? you to gain the whole world and, and to lose your soul in the process. So Palestinian Jew said that, that some people remember his name even, but that's, that's, you know, he really, he was talking on the street about that to poor people. And he said, you know, what, you know, don't, don't try to play that game. 
you know, you know. So all right, I got two hundred billion, and I'm twelfth on the Ford's five hundred list. I want to be first. There's no end to that kind of stuff. So uh, here, here's Merton on this, and uh, it, it it was in a book called The Wisdom of the Desert, and the it's in the introduction to the book, which is worth the price of the book because not only do you get all these sayings of desert fathers, but um, you got the introduction by Merton. And Merton says this in the introduction. He says, um, what can we gain by sailing to the moon? If we're not able to cross the abyss that separates us from ourselves, this is the most important of all the voyages of discovery. So get that, because Merton is, by this time, in the early 60s, uh, you know, late 50s, early 60s, he's realizing that to be a monk, to actually work with the soul, you're, you're an outlier. You're, you've got a different viewpoint than the culture. You become a culture critic in a way, which is a Merton that a lot of connected folks didn't like, you know. But he said, you know, but basically this is courage. He's saying, uh, what does it mean? You know, that was when we were all obsessed about beating the Russians to the moon. He said, what does it mean to be able to sail to the moon if you haven't, you haven't been able to cross the abyss, this emptiness between this gap between you and yourself? He said, that's the most important voyage. That's what it means to be courageous. And so he's talking about becoming a term I made up. Uh, he's becoming an intronaut instead of an astronaut. An intronaut is somebody who goes and explores the inside. See, our problem is we identify with everything out here. Buddha recognized that uh, long ago. He said, maybe we got to give up trying to rearrange the furniture in our living room, thinking if I just get it just right, then I'll be happy. Well, we're not, con we're, we're not connected to the most important thing. There is no, there is no uh, fix for that in the outside world. And going inside, you know, what does that even mean to people? That's why when people start this work, they have to feel sort of lost because they haven't trained in this. We're training in this. That's what monasteries and retreat houses, the Buddha invented the idea of a monastery. You pulled out of society for a while and trained in this internet training. Uh, and then when you felt ready, you went out and in, back into the world. You're an island of sanity there. You're an island who, you're a person who was connected to everything and you could just have an effect by being in the world. You were connected, you see. Just like I lost connection, I had to reconnect today. Yeah, we have a version to that. But it's, uh, to be an intronaut is to do that. It takes a dedicated, here's, here's the, you know, the end point for us, it takes a dedicated kind of contemplative practice of some sort to shift the immense gravity of anybody's life in the modern world. The immense gravity holding you on the surface, the immense gravity your personality has, to shift that to uh, where you are shifting there to, uh, as uh, one of my friend, great friends said, he said, uh, Merton College shifted to the true self. I do like the, the sense uh, of the, the whole self, the connected self. Because when you when you shift to the truth, what Merton called the true self, you're you're. He said, if if you find your true self, you're going to find God, and if you find God, you're going to find your true self. Yeah, well, true the true there's always false, and if you get into true and false thing, which is a little confusing. I think Merton would have changed that if he had lived longer than fifty two, and uh, uh, the sense of the whole self, this holistic thing that the whole self is connected to all of this and that that takes to shift gravity from just this personality career you know this uh, smaller thing it's not bad but it's it's just part of what you are uh to um a person who realizes their soul and that they are a soul and then that doesn't make you distant from the material world it actually connects you to everything then you're saint francis you know, who is, you know, connected to everything, you know, one of the great examples in the Christian thing. And then, you know, then you're Rumi. 
See, these are the guys that, uh, then you're my grandmother if you had known her. You, you, you just become wisdom and compassion and kindness. And the world needs a bunch of those people walking around. You bump into them in your life. You bump into one, changes your life. But it takes a dedicated contemplative practice because there's, there's a huge amount of gravity the way we grow up in our culture to all the stuff and to all our roles, to all our personality, nothing wrong with them. But if you stay there looking for, um, you, you just be looking for that thing you don't have. And that's the self that's connected to all that, to be relinked to it, you know? Uh, and now for a lot of us, I'd say most of us who show up for this, being in the second half of life uh, without a, a serious spiritual practice is like running a wild river without a paddle. As you face aging and as you face all the stuff that's going on in this world that keeps changing too, but your body is changing, you're, you're, you're going towards uh, where this body, you're going to leave this body. Uh, it's a very challenging part of time. And, you know, what is midlife? Well, you know, you live to be, you know, 82, like whatever the, we're in the 80s, you know, they say you live to be 80. Well, if you're in your 40s or 50s, you start start to think about that. Now, if you don't have a spiritual practice, I mean, imagine being a, people pay good money to run wild rivers in canoes and kayaks and on rafts, but without a paddle, that's that's not heaven. That's that's a kind of hell. And most people do not have a paddle for that stretch of river. Uh, and if religion is no, you know, if the formal religions aren't aren't giving you that, and for some people they still are, but for other people they're not. That's why most people are here. Um, then you've got you've got to create. You know, you know, there's plenty of teachings now. When I started could barely find a book on meditation. Yoga was just peeking its head into a culture. And I had let go of all the, the Christian stuff because it wasn't helping me at that time. You know, Buddhism let me, led me back to the Aramaic Jesus. And the, <laughs> so I've got both of these guys now in both of the, the practice systems. Uh, I'll, I'll introduce the, the meditation today with a, a, a poem I call Trappist Zen, because that sort of, that's what my life has become. The Zen guys got me going, and then I end up coming to this monastery here, and I end up discovering a different Jesus. And so this idea of uh, kind of hybrid spiritual practice that I've been working on now for you know, 50 years, uh, Buddha and Jesus, they're both in it. Yeah. And it's up to you to create your own, because nobody's, nobody's at all interested in, in your problems if you're not. See, so putting together your own practice and then being faithful to it. It's the best thing you can do when you're facing aging and I mean, think about being on a wild river in some, in some container, raft, kayak, canoe, boat with no paddle. Most people are dealing with it that way. And uh, that's why we're here to to practice. Okay, it's that serious. Well, I think that's good enough for the talk. <laughs>